Hallelujah. Well, good morning and welcome to Rima International Bible Church in Silver Spring, Maryland. This is uh, God's people gathering here today, June 6, in the year of our Lord, 2021. We're beginning a seven-part series called the I Am series. We just came out of a series on Joshua. And we're beginning a new series called the I Am series. And it's based on Jesus' seven utterances of I Am uh, that you find in the book of John. Today we are reading from John chapter 6, uh, verses 25 through 35. And um, for those of you in the house, I kindly ask you to rise. Um, if you're watching this online, I kindly ask you to get your Bible. And um, let, let's look into the Word together. And when, once I get the cue, we'll, we'll go with our reading. So on the count of three, let's read with power and conviction. One, two, three. Amen. Let's go. When they found him on the other side of the lake... They asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him... God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Amen. 28. Then they asked him, what must we do to the works God requires? Jesus answered, the works of God is this, to believe in the one who he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. 32. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Let's read the last verse again, verse 35, on the count of three. One, two, three. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. May God add a blessing to his word today. Father, we thank you that you are the bread of life. You are the bread of life. You are a gift to humanity. You are a gift to us. Thank you for bread of life. We will never be hungry. We will never want. That void in our spirits will be filled. Thank you for bread of life. As we eat bread of life, our lives will find purpose. As we eat bread of life, we will fulfill destiny. As we eat bread of life, we will become like Christ. Thank you for this word, O oh God. Minister to us in unique ways. Take my words and, and, and translate it into language that hearers can understand. Use it to meet needs in spectacular ways, oh God. Because you are the bread of life. I thank you and I bless you for this privilege to share your word. And God's people shouted amen. Amen. Church, you may have your seats. The bread of life. The bread of life. John 6, 25 through 35. We thank God for this opportunity. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. In the book of John, we are introduced to seven mentions of I am. Can you say I am? I am? 
The God we serve is the I am God. Amen. The book of John from chapter 6 through 15, you will find at seven different places, Jesus say, I am. And then he follows up with something. The first one is, I am bread of life. I am light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. That's Jesus. Seven times. Seven stands for perfection, right? So on seven counts, Jesus makes this I am pronouncement. It's called the, the, the I am discourse of Jesus. Of course, the book of John is all about the ministry of Jesus. And if you, if you paid attention, I didn't just say, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. There there are two thoughts. I am bread of life. And that's because the I am contains something sacred, something that is important to you and to me. The concept of the I am originates from Yahweh himself, the self-existing God. In Exodus 3, Moses has an encounter with God called the burning bush experience. He was tending his father-in-law's flock, Jethro's flock, and God showed up and called him and sent him to Pharaoh to go and deliver God's people. God's people had been in captivity for over 400 years and the time was up for God to deliver. There's always a time for deliverance. Can the church say amen? Amen. Hang in there because there is a time for deliverance. That's not religious thought. That's true. One day God comes and says, it's over. I'm going to give you a break. One day he shows up. They had been in in servitude for over 400 years. And I'm sure they lost all hope. If you've lost hope, get some hope. Because deliverance cometh. Because we serve the I am God. Amen. And so Moses was standing his flock and God showed up in the burning bush. The bush was burning, but was not burning because we are dealing with the I am God, the self-existing God. And Moses asked him a question. He says, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? The, the, the thought of a nameless God is remote in Egypt. Because in Egypt, like in India, they are gods upon gods upon gods upon gods upon gods. And every god has a name. Amen? So his first instinct when God says, I'm going to send you to my people... Because time has come for deliverance. He says, okay, when I go, I get the message, but when I go, what is your identity? What, who sent me, God? You will find rather sun God in Egypt, the God of radiance. You will find Horus, the God of vengeance. Thought, the God of knowledge and wisdom. Hathor, the goddess of motherhood. Mutt. The mother goddess and and God and God and God and God and God and God and God. So he says, okay, you want me to go? What's your name? What's your name? God fill in the blanks. What's your identity? And surprisingly, God doesn't give him a name. God has no shortage of names. We've studied it a few times. Jehovah this and Jehovah that. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shekem. All the Jehovah's, he has many names. But on this particular occasion, he doesn't give him any of that. Instead of giving him a name, he says to Moses, I am who I am. Can you say that? Yeah, that's profound. He says, I am who I am. You want to know who sent you? I am who I am. Church, that's the God we serve. And instead of giving him a name like that, he gives him his identity. He says, go, go use my 
identity. Like I give you my identity card, go and use it. My identity is it. It's good enough. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. That's important. I am has sent me. Friends, we deal with the I am God. And I'm going to be using that phrase a lot. We deal with the I am God. Amen. Amen. The God we serve, his name is I am. And he continues, he says that this is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. The God of Rima Church is the I am God. The God of your family is the I am God. The God, our God is the I am God. And that phrase is more than enough. That's all you need. I am has in it everything that you'll ever need. It's a blank check. It's a blank check. I am fill in the blanks. That's 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 good. That's a good check. He said, My name is I am. So you fill in the dots. I am healer, check it off. I am provider, check it off. I am promoter, check it off. Oh, we serve the I am God. And if we were to stop the service here, that's the message that the God you serve. He is the I am God. The, the I am means the self-existing God. A God who does not depend on anyone or anything. He is God all by himself. <laughs> yeah, he is God. You see, the government needs you to pay taxes. If you don't pay tax, we ain't got a government. And they can run the land. God does not need you. He wants you. He loves you. That's why he sent his son to come and die for you. This one, he's the self-existing God. Names are significant. Names are significant. And, and, and the God we serve has the name, Bible says, above every other name. Every knee bows at the mention of his name. And so today, if there's any need that is contending, if there's any principality that is contending, if there's any need that is contending, I declare, if there's any name that is contending with your destiny, I declare that that knee must bow in the name of Jesus. If there's any principality, if there's any witchcraft, if there's any wizardry, if there's any demonic power that wants to crush you, I declare that because of the name of Jesus, that knee bows. The knees that contend over our children, trying to destroy them, the knees that, that try to move them to the left when we're trying to move them to the right, I declare that by the name of Jesus, that knee bows. Hallelujah. In the Hebrew language, there is no present tense for the verb to be. And so the phrase, I am that I am, translates in multiple ways. And you want to pay attention to this. I am that I am also equals I am who I am. I am what I am. I will become what I choose to become. I will be what I will be. I create whatever I create. I am the existing one. All of this is in the simple phrase, I am that I am. And that's the God that we serve. We serve a self-sufficient God, he opens doors that no man can shut. He shuts doors that no man can open. He lifts one up and he brings one down. And that is your God, church. That's why I love Hebrews 12. He says that, but you have come to Mount Zion. To the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to God, the judge of all. Bible describes God as the God of all flesh. 
He rules over all flesh, including your boss. Including your boss who's messing you up. Including your family members who are trying to arrange your destiny. Who are trying to pull you back when you try to go forward. Including your friends who are talking against you. Including those who are trying to undermine you. He's the God of all flesh. You, you must know God to a point where things don't bother you so much. So things don't get under your skin. You must be comfortable to know that your God is the I am God. And he got your back. And that comes through relationship. We serve the I am God. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 12. We have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Hallelujah. That is the God we serve. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Throughout their history, God's people reserved the I am phrase for Yahweh. It was a name they dedicated to him. When they said the I am, there was only one person. It was God. When you read the Old Testament, there are several mentions of promises of a Messiah who would come to save God's people. In fact, I was looking at a list of 351 Old Testament prophecies that had been fulfilled through Christ. 351, and I'm sure there are more. So for God's people, these messianic prophecies fuel their expectation. If you hear something for 50 times, you will expect. If, if, if I tell you that we're going to have dinner after this or lunch after this, you will expect that. They lived all their lives hearing about a Messiah who would come to save them. So generation after generation, year after year, century after century, their whole psyche, they were living in anticipation of this coming Messiah. And then finally when Jesus arrives on the scene, you find that there is evidence of several folks trying to confirm whether this Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. It's almost like a puzzle. They're trying to fit it. Does he fit into the puzzle? Does he check off all the boxes? They, they lived all their lives awaiting a Messiah, and then the Messiah comes and they want to do a litmus test. And, and that, there's some wisdom in that. Is he the Messiah? And part of the problem was that they couldn't believe it when the promise finally manifested. Isn't that what happens with us sometimes? God gives you a promise and you wait for so long and it comes through and, and you are not even expecting it any longer. We spoke about time last week. Time, time has a way of letting us forget what God has said. The Bible says, has he said it? And will he not do it? If God said it, hold on to it and live in faith. Live in faith. Don't, don't put a period where God has put a comma. Has he said it? And will he not do it? Bible says that he never changes. He never changes. We should be like the psalmist in Psalm 126. When God turned their captivity around, he says that they were like them that dreamed. They, they were like in a dreamland. He says, then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord had done great things for us, whereof we are glad. If God has promised you something, though it tarries, Bible says it will surely come. Wait for it. Don't check out on God. Keep going, doing your business, but leave that promise at the foot of God. In the fullness of time, he will manifest. The bread of life was prophesied about thousands of years in advance. The first mention in Genesis chapter 3 talks about the seed of the woman. And time went by. But in the fullness of time, he showed up. And naturally he was met with skepticism. They're trying to figure out, is that him or is that not him? 
they had what I call identity issues with Jesus. That's why the Bible says that in John 1, he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Why didn't they receive Jesus? It was too familiar. It was too ridiculous. He didn't fit their mold. He, he, they had their own mindset about who God was going to use and, and how God was going to play it out. And, and, and God bypassed all of that and put Jesus Christ right in their front and they couldn't see it. Until this day, our Jewish brothers and sisters still don't accept Jesus Christ. We are talking about the bread of life. We're getting there. I've shared this a few times. About three years ago, I was standing in a synagogue. I was doing a study in Rockville, about 15 miles from here. And I was talking with a rabbi. She was giving me a tour of the place. And I asked so many questions. And, and she made a reference to the books of Moses in the Hebrew scriptures. And I, I countered by saying, oh, you mean the books of Moses like the ones we have in the Christian Bible? In the, in the Old Testament of the Christian Bible. And she was quick to correct me. She says, we don't, we don't use Old Testament. We don't even make a reference to Old Testament. And I said, why not? She said, because a mention of the Old Testament is an admission of the New Testament. And I said, and what is wrong with that? And she said that because we Jews, Jesus' folk, don't recognize Jesus. And the New Testament is all about Jesus. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. They had an issue over identity. We're talking about the bread of life. They had an issue about Jesus they knew. They knew him as a kid. Mary's boy child. He went to buy bread from the marketplace. They saw him with fish and all of that. So by the time God was doing his work, familiarity had taken away what God has purposed and that's a lesson for all of us God who is I am will do things by himself he will use whom he chooses he will bless those he blesses he doesn't need your neighbor's approval to bless you he doesn't need a counsel before he will do what he does with your life because he's the I am God. As we, got, we went through the book of Joshua, one of the things that fascinated me was the fact that God used Rahab. Oh, Rahab is a harlot. Rahab is a prostitute. But God in his own might used Rahab to help his people. And that's not a pass for prostitution, but it's mind-blowing because that cannot fit into our paradigm. How can God use Rahab? Better question, how can God not use Rahab? How can God not use you? And this is important because in the culture in which we live, across the land we struggle with identity. Oh, this can't be a woman, it's, it's a man's job. But God can use women too. And he used them all through the Bible. We have our own stereotypical mindset of who God will use, how God will do stuff. He has to be black, not white, or white, not black. He has to be Native American or Hispanic. No, 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 no. The I am God does things at his own discretion. The I am God operates when things don't look right. The I am God goes when everybody stops. The I am God heals when everybody expects you to die. That's the God we serve. And so don't wait for men's approval. Wait for God's approval. When God says go, go. The Bible says that God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Believe the promises of God. Believe in the simplicity of God's work. He, le he can use you just as you are because he's the I am God. 
God's greatest works often don't roll out with bells and whistles. They begin as simply as this. As simply as Jesus came. But that was the bread of life. And so there was a lot of confusion over Jesus' identity. By the time he showed up on the stage, the Romans had problems, the Jews had problems, kings and governors. The high priest had a problem with who he was as they all tried to figure him out. Who is this? Who is this? After centuries of an announcement, there was a vacuum in their spirits. There was a hole, a gaping hole inside of them trying to fit that puzzle. They were looking for the missing piece in the puzzle. So they were hungry and they were thirsty and they were searching for the answer just to fit. John the Baptist in Matthew 11 was in prison and then he heard about this Messiah. And so Bible says that he sent his disciples to ask, verse 3 of Matthew 11, are you the Messiah we must be expecting or should we keep looking for somewhere else? Are you the one trying to fill that void? Are you the one? Jesus said, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. So this is a clear example of John trying to fit the missing piece. He says, are you the one? That's just one example. In John 18, Jesus stands before Pilate. And in a dialogue, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. And then Pilate cuts him and says that, You are king then. You are king then. And then Jesus says, You say that I am king. And then he continues, he says that everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Reported, retorted Pilate. Pilate too has that vacuum. There is confusion over Jesus' identity. We're talking about bread of life. There is confusion. Who is Jesus? He's coming to town, is stirring lots of confusion. And person after person, authority after authority is trying to check that box Jesus is what and so Pilate says you are a king then and Jesus says you say so in Luke 23 there's another discourse between Pilate and Jesus and in this time Pilate is standing before a crowd and the crowd the crowd must choose between Jesus and Barabbas, Barabbas is a murderer and an insurrectionist. Jesus is the son of God, the bread of life. And the folks can't make that decision easily. Pilate wanted to release Jesus. He said, I don't see anything that this guy has done wrong. What crime has he committed? I found no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and released Bible says that they shouted all the more crucify him crucify him crucify him Jesus they, 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 they wanted to they, they were going to take Barabbas over Jesus why would you do that because they got the identity thing wrong and this is the same group of people who a short while ago were shouting Hosanna Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see, this is why you must know God for yourself. And you must know who God has made you, what God has called you to be. This is why you cannot rely on the approval and the confirmation and the affirmation of men. 
Because many times men and women will get it wrong about you. When God created you, I was not there. When God created you, your friends were not there. When he gave you a set of gifts and talents, it was just you. And you will be the only one. You will be the only one to know what God has called you to do. So when God calls you a friend, go ahead and do it. Amen. If Jesus were not certain about who he was, it would have been pretty disastrous. It would have been pretty disastrous. In Matthew 12, the confusion goes over, and I have a few more examples. Jesus was accused of being demon-possessed. It gets worse. In chapter 12 of Matthew, they brought a demon-possessed man to him. He was blind and mute, and he healed them. The blind man saw, and, and he spoke, and all were amazed and said, Is he not the son of David? Still that lingering void. Is he not the son of David? It's a question that has been on their mind. The Bible says that when the Pharisees heard it, they said, The man does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. And Jesus said, If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided. We go to John 10. There is a festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus was in the temple courts. The Jews had gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Once again, looking for the answer. And Jesus tells them something pretty profound. He says that, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand and the Father and I are one. The Bible says that the Jews pick stones and they're about to cast it at him. And he said, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which one of these do you stone me? And they reply, we are not stoning you for any good work, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And that's at the heart of their quest. Jesus, in their minds, is equating himself with the I am God. And that is not acceptable. We know you. We know your humble beginnings. How can you be God? And then the final example I want to use before we get into the bread part. Jesus had one other opportunity to address this lingering question. Once again, he was accused of being demon-possessed. They accused him of being a Samaritan and being demon-possessed. And when the, we, we can all understand the demon-possessed part, that it's, 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 it's an abomination. It's, how can you even say that? But the Samaritan part is equally worse. Jesus Christ, according to prophecy, must come through the line of David. He must be a Jew. He must be a Hebrew. So if you take him out of that and make him a Samaritan, then basically he's no good. It's like, it's like calling the best student in class the worst. How can Jesus be a Samaritan? But because they're trying to move things around, because of their own void and confusion, they say, no, you're a Samaritan. In other words, there is no way you can be the son of God. But that's not true. And Jesus said most assuredly, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Just follow me. Then the Jews, this is my, um, John 8. 
Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets who are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? And that's a question that we will all have to address throughout life. If Jesus himself, the son of God, was questioned, guess what? You will be questioned too. God will call and anoint and baptize you for great works and folks will still ask you, who do you think you are? It's ridiculous that they will ask Jesus that question. And Jesus says that, he continues, says that before Abraham was I am. We're talking about the I am God. Jesus says before Abraham was I am. He makes a claim to divinity. He, he equates himself with God. He says that before Abraham was I am. Going back to the I am that we began with. Going back to the seven discourses of I am that Jesus came. He says, before Abraham was, I am. God will not do anything without leaving a witness. And so throughout this confusion, he still gave a witness through Peter. Peter was, Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? This thing about Jesus being the bread of life is all about identity. Can you say identity? identity. It's all about identity. It's wrapped up in identity. If you can solve the identity problem, you got the answer. He, he came out and he says, who do people say that I am? And that was the theme of Jesus' ministry. There was so much confusion and, and, this, and misunderstanding. And throughout his ministry, that kept coming up. And they replied, some say you are John the Baptist, others say you are Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah or the prophets. And he says, but who do you say that I am? He personalized it. And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Can you say you are the Messiah? You are the Messiah. Say you are the Messiah, you are the, Messiah. the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. I pray that God will reveal himself to you. I pray that in this church, in this journey of life, God will reveal himself to you so that you will know the I am God. So that you will walk with the I am God. So that you will borrow his identity card. And wherever you go, you say the I am God sent me. And that's the end of the story. When the I am God sent you, you don't need to ask questions. When the I am God sends you, you don't need to always understand. When the I am God sends you, you don't need to rationalize. When the I am God calls and sends you, you don't need men's approval. Because he's the I am God. The I am has called us. And so because of this confusion over I am, because of this perception that Jesus was equating himself with the I am God, Jesus finally has to address the I am issue. And that's when he goes into this discourse, I am bread of life. I am light of the world. And each I am, he's referring to the I am in Genesis. He's referring to that utterance. It's different to say, I am the bread of life. No, he says, I am meaning God, bread of life. I am the door. I am good shepherd. I am resurrection and life. I am the way, truth, and life. I am the vine. What else do you want? Seven occasions, seven is the number of perfection. And in seven different instances, he makes this I am declaration and equates himself with God. For today and for the remaining time we have today, we will look at I am the bread of life. 
And every week we'll take one of the I am's to we I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. In John 6, the text we read, Jesus said, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread. Can you say true bread? Yes. From heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Can you say life to the world? Sad, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. It had to be bread, not cake, not pizza. And we talked about this the other day. Because bread is universal. So there is only one that satisfies across all cultures, across all lands, across all nations. It is Jesus Christ. I was watching the news the other day and a boy was down south, uh, you know, down across the southern border. And he, and he was saying that he has never eaten meat in his life, about 8 or 11, I think. And he said he has never eaten meat before. And I thought about all the chicken we eat in America. Uh, I was stunned. He's never, in his life, never had meat. But I'm sure he's had bread. Jesus had to use bread because bread is common, bread is universal. Everybody can get bread and everybody can relate to bread. So Jesus is saying that I am an equal opportunity God. The God who did a breakthrough for that one will do one for you too. I am the bread of life. Bread is basic. So you go to some cultures, you talk about pizza, they never heard about pizza. Then you talk about cake, they don't know cake, but they know bread. So Jesus begins by saying, I am bread of life. Meaning that any man who is needing of me, needs me can get me. I am not too distant. The Bible says that God is near. God is near. I am the bread. Bread is easily accessible. You go to the dollar store, you will get two for a dollar. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Never forget that your God is easily accessible. He's close by. And he declares this, I am, to fill their void. They've been searching. And people are searching. They've been asking questions. Where is this guy? Where is this Messiah? How are we going to know? And he shows up. And in an answer to that question, in an answer to that voice, he says, I am bread of life. Bread is staple food. Bread of life means that he's the, the true spiritual satisfaction for us. It means that fulfillment only comes through Jesus. It means that without Jesus, we are running on empty. We are practicing religion without Christ. That's why people try to use drugs and entertainment and money and education and status to fill a void. But there is only one bread of life. No amount of success without Christ will satisfy. Jesus offers a spiritual bread that feeds our spiritual lives. Just as natural bread feeds natural hunger, Jesus Christ feeds the innermost being. Man is a spirit, lives in a body and has a soul. So things that have to do with eternity, there is only one who can satisfy. It's Jesus. So church, let's continue eating on the bread of life. We can never grow too big for Jesus. We will never outgrow Jesus because he is the only one who satisfies. Amen. Amen. That's why the Bible says that godliness with contentment is great gain. You can never run out 
of an appetite for Jesus. Bread is important. Natural bread that is. But spiritual bread is even more important. And that's why it's important for the Christian church to drive people to the bread of life. Because the Christian church can easily slip away from the main focus of Christ into religion. There are enough religions out there. And all of them are looking of how they're going to get to Jesus. How they're going to get to God. But the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's the other way. God reaching out to man. I am the bread of life reaching out to us. Without the bread of life, we are like Adam after his sin, walking dead. Without the bread of life, we have no purpose. Jesus performed many miracles, and for most of them, there was bread at the center of it. He multiplied five loaves and two fish for 5,000 folks. He multiplied seven loaves and a few fish for 4,000. And the whole point was pointing the people to himself pointing the people to himself the bread of life satisfies amen the bread of life completes the bread of life brings fullness the bread of life fills in the blanks you remember filling the blanks your teacher writes a sentence and fill in the blank the bread of life fills in the blanks in our lives so if you've been searching for whatever you've been searching for, go to the bread of life. Amen. The whole essence of this is that the bread satisfies. Amen. Jesus fills the void in our life. That emptiness that we've been searching for, only Jesus can fill it. Amen. Only Jesus can fill it. He is the one who satisfies. He says that the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world then Jesus declared I am the bread of life whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty church simple message in all you're getting in all your attainment in life there is only one that really brings satisfaction that brings come if you amass wealth into the skies and jesus is not at the center of your life you are running on empty you, you the bible says what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul your center of gravity must be christ Amen. through and through and as i close i want to flip the message around to some folks who might be watching this or maybe folks here who are looking through their lives and are asking all the questions if Jesus satisfies if Jesus fills in the blanks if Jesus completes the puzzle if Jesus fills in what I'm missing what about this and that and that that I'm missing and, and that probably maybe that's everybody here Maybe you're missing something. And maybe you've once upon a time read David's Psalm 37 verse 25. It says that I was young and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. But maybe your reality is a little different. Maybe, maybe you have been hungry before. Maybe you look at the scripture and say, that's very subjective. That was David, that's not me. And many people have been hungry before. I've been hungry before. We went to boarding school those days. Sometimes you will eat or not eat at the discretion of the bigger boys. I knew Jesus. So maybe you, 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 are, you are listening to this and, and you're hearing that Jesus satisfies and Jesus satisfies, but, but, you, but you, 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 you're looking at all the boxes in your life that have not been Check it off. I, I want to give you a different perspective. Bible says that I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Never go hungry. With Jesus, you will never go hungry. 
you will never go hungry. Here is the practical application of this. Maybe in the natural, you're hungry. Maybe you're falling short, you're missing something vital to life. But you have Jesus. You have Jesus. Here is the truth about it. Your little, or maybe your zero, with Jesus, is more than somebody's much without Jesus. Your little with Jesus is more than somebody's much without Jesus. Go ask yourself why folks commit suicide who have tons of cash. Go ask yourself why marriages fall apart for the rich and famous. They have everything they can ever dream of, but there's a void. Many years ago, one man, a guest preacher at a church came, and I had very little going for me and my house at the time. And he just looked at me and he says that, something to this effect that your little is much. And I said, you must be crazy, sir. He said, your little is much. He was right. It so happens that what I didn't have, the zero that I had, is the very thing that God took and used it to promote me. If I had had plenty, God could not have done it. Church, we serve an I am God. You do not need to be sorry whether you are abased or abounding. You do not need to be pitiful whether you have or whether you don't have. If you have Christ, that is your advantage. That is your advantage. That is what will give you an edge in the world. And so if you have Christ, hold on to him. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. He will open doors that no man can shut. He will shut other doors that no man can open. Remember that God's people walked through the Red Sea. And then they walked through the, the Jordan. Because they serve an I am God. As I close, I want to address you. I thank you for your time. Thank you for following this ministry. I don't know where you are. But wherever you are, I want to encourage you to receive the bread of life. The Jesus we serve, he is the bread of life. You've tried success. You've tried education. You've tried drugs. You've tried relationship, you've tried sex, you've tried everything under the sun, but you have not tried the bread of life. I present the bread of life to you. He will satisfy your hunger and your thirst. Receive the bread of life, which is Christ. Walk with him. Commit your ways unto him. And he will pull you through some of the worst times in your life. I'm Pastor Frederick Numadison, and on behalf of this body of believers here at Rima International Bible Church in Silver Spring, I thank you for worshiping with us today. Be blessed. Take this word to heart and let the bread of life satisfy you. Amen. Thank you. Let's thank God for this.